let's um, move on to our second speaker. Um, and she is Dr. Sarah Lightman. And Sarah is a London-based artist and writer. She is an honorary research fellow in the School of Arts at Birkbeck College, University of London, and a faculty member at the Royal Drawing School where she teaches graphic narratives. Sarah edited the first ever book on Jewish women's autobiographical comics, the multi-award winning Graphic Details, Jewish Women's Confessional Comics, which um, I can thoroughly recommend completely impartially, uh, nothing to do with the fact that I contribute to it, but it's, it's a terrific book. Um, as is her own autobiographical graphic novel, The Book of Sarah, which was published in the UK by Myriad Editions and in North America by Penn State University Press. She is currently editing her monograph entitled Dressing Eve and Other Reparative Acts in Women's Autobiographical Comics. And that book will be published by Penn State University Press. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Sarah. Hi, thank you, David. Can you hear me? Is that okay? We can hear you, but you're slightly faint. Uh, if I hold it here, is that better? Yes. Great. Thank you. So before I begin, I want to thank all the organizers of the, day today, of the event today, especially Ben Grant, who first introduced me to the works of Jenny Diskey over two years ago. I also want to thank uh, David and Ben for being my cast today, because I'll be reading out Aline Kaminsky Crumbs, Kaminsky Crumbs comics. But in advance of us reading those comics, I want to warn you, they have quite a lot of quite offensive words in them. So this is a disclaimer that we'll be using words that are pretty inappropriate, but they're part of the comic. So there you have it. So the works of Aline Kaminsky Crum and Jenny Diskey have many moments of overlap, which I'll explore today. There are the striking autobiographical similarities. They were both born into deeply unhappy marriages and were both verbally and physically abused by their parents. They also both had to navigate their newly widowed mothers after the death of their fathers. But it's not just these topics that they share. Kaminsky, Crum and Disky retell intimate life experiences in ways that are at once vulnerable, antagonistic and surprising. And they do this through repeating and manoeuvring their memories. Disky herself writes, memory is continuously, continually created, a story told and retold using jigsaw pieces of experience. Memory is not false in the sense that it is willfully bad, but it is excitingly corrupt in its inclination to make a proper story of the past. Or we have Kaminsky Crumb's more pithy response, I forgot I already drew that. I am grateful for writing this paper as these, write as these artists and writers ground and comfort me. Some aspects of their recorded lives resonate deeply with me whilst others do not. I have not had the family abuse they did, but I have a tricky relationship with my family, and now, a year after the death of my father, I am still taking time away from my mother to care for myself. Beyond these shared experiences, Kaminsky, Crum, Disky, and I have more in common than what hurt in the past. My talk will end today with momentary happiness, quiet joy within ourselves, a moment of being at peace with our bodies, and the world. Today, I will quote from Jenny Diskey's books In Gratitude, Skating to Antarctica, and On Trying to Keep Still. Aline Kaminsky Crum is a US born, France based Jewish comics artist. A leading voice in the comics underground movement since the 1970s, she created one of the first autobiographical comics by a woman and calls herself the grandmother of whiny tell-all comics. Today, I will reference her comics collection, Love That Bunch, Need More Love, and also Drawn Together, a collection of autobiographical comics co-created with her husband, Robert Crumb. Finally, I will reference my own autobiographical graphic novel, The Book of Sarah. One note before I start, when I speak of the younger selves in the text and the comics, I will use the names Aline and Jenny. When I speak of the authors, I will call them Kaminsky Crumb and Disky, respectively. So now over to David and Ben, who will be reading out some, this comic for us. Come on. 
podcast. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Great. <laughs> okay, I shall start off then. Why don't you leave her alone? Are you telling me how to handle these monsters? Yeah, I am. I got some rights around here. If you do, I don't see you pay the bills. Well, we wouldn't even have this gorgeous house if my father hadn't paid for it. I come from a high-class family, not scum like yours. You spoiled piece of shit. Fat-ass cunt. I hate you. I'm going to call my mother. Good. Go snivel to your mommy. I made them fight, she thinks. Girls have to be good or else men go wild. Oh, and I'll be little boy. Teddy wants to die. She's got a bad seed complex. Thank you. In a later scene, we have another argument. Meanwhile, my mother got bigger and nastier. Get away, Arnie. You're such an animal. Come on, sweets. Aren't you going to let me? Arnie has a breakdown. What a mouth on you. I'm going to shut it up. No, leave me alone, Daddy. Help, stop. Gog, gog. Birth of sexual masochism. Later, he's contrite. I'm sorry, kid. I don't know what came over me. I got a lot of pressure on me. Your mother's not nice to me. Jeez, he's so gross when he's being pathetic. I understand, Daddy. I'm not mad. It was my fault for making you so angry. Thank you. These pages reflect Kaminsky Crumb's destabilising aesthetics and use of language. On her pages, oh, we'll go back one sec. On her pages, the drawings are uncomfortable on the eye. In their visually manic quality, there is nowhere calm to rest one's gaze. The dialogue itself is harsh and abrasive and constantly threatening. There is no security in the visuals. The central conceits of the narratives themselves seem to waver. And Aline seems to draw different in panels of the same story. Her hair changes style, her face distorts, her body grows and shrinks. Another comic that features um, her parents arguing is Arnie's air conditioner. Here, Aline worries that her parents will divorce and she looks for stability as she organizes her dolls. Um, ben, do you want to just read little Aline? No, it's just mommy and, mommy and daddy hate each other. I'm afraid they'll get a divorce and we are poor too. I'm scared no one will want me. I must line my dollies up. Instability is also a theme in Disky's family arguments, which are told in a more indirect way. The text itself is far more measured, but the contents is in intensely destabilizing. Here we see how memory and family history are manipulated by each of her parents for their own benefit. The truth, she would tell me, was that my father had been imprisoned when I was very small, and my mother had covered up the fact so I wouldn't think less of him. The truth, my father would tell me, was that my mother had never had a breakdown when she was carried out the flat after he left, but had faked it in order to get attention and make my father return to her. Disky's parents do not think about their child's well-being at all. Instead, they apply verbal parental alienation to manipulate the past so it fits the version they want their child to hear and believe. They use psychological exploitation to distance the young Jenny from the other parent and for her in turn to side with them. As they challenge Jenny's understanding of her childhood history, they are introducing her to a perpetually erratic relationship to memory. The younger Jenny. Oh, in these examples, Kaminsky Crum and Disky are both ch the children they were and the adults they are now, listening in to these conversations. The young Aline finds herself guilty. I made them fight and longs to control her environment and have some security. I must line up my dollies. The older Aline notes a birth of sexual masochism, a wry awareness of how her violence of her home influenced her own later choices. The younger Jenny hears devastating stories about her parents lying to her, about prison and about mental illness. The older Jenny can delicately place these harsh statements into lightly balanced sentences which seem to hum with a rhythm of words, like a chorus of a song, the truth, the truth. 
Both Diskies and Aline Kaminsky Crumb's parents turned their anger from each other towards their child, and their dysfunctional parenting also included sexual abuse. Aline's father is inappropriate to his daughter. Full grown by age nine. My God, look at that ass. It's fabulous. She's going to turn into a slut now. Still an innocent kid. Much to my horror. Gotta pinch that thing. This fine ass is going to get you by, honey. Better get used to it. Shut up, Daddy. You're gross. Yuck, don't say that stuff. It's so big and out there. This is fun. I got her all in a conniption. Okay, and then he, Arnie then talks about it to his friend, Punchy. I overheard Arnie and his pal, Punchy. Yeah, Punchy, got to see that kid's ass. Shit, it's magnificent. Oh, yeah, I'll have to check it out. Better watch her like a hawk. She'll want to stoop before you know it. Over my dead body, I'll kill anyone that I catch with her. Yeah, that's right, Arnie. It's discomforting to read the language of sexual excitement Arnie uses in relation to his daughter's body, whilst he invites his friend to do the same. The young Aline seems disgusted by her father, but is powerless to stop him. As an artist, Kaminsky Crumb cannot protect her younger self, but she can draw a comic and tell the world about his inappropriate behaviour. When Arnie wasn't leering at his own daughter, he was often cruel to her. In many of her comics, Aline discusses how very self-aware she was of her appearance, and she describes herself in disparaging terms and feels very ugly in her own eyes. This scene occurs while she was trying to cover up spots in the bathroom mirror. It is a repeated agonising moment. I try to cover up my zits and disguise my flaws. I need more pancake. Hey, hurry up in there, gorgeous. You can't shine shit. My sensitive folks kicked this already beaten dog. Get out of that bathroom already. You can't shine shit. And get hair out of your face. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, neither parent, um, neither parent protects Aline, comforts or assists her. And since this mean is, scene is mentioned a number of times in her comics, the question remains, did Aline forget she drew it before? Or did this happen numerous times? It seems the phrase lingers in her mind, especially since she is often presented as anxious about her looks in her comics, for example, in Nose Job. And in her later comic, Of What Use Is The Old Bunch? Aline remembers her father in Growing Up As Arnie's Girl. Yeah, my father was a character. And it's easier to think kindly of him when he's not around to torture me. It is noteworthy that Aline uses the word kindly to describe her own response to her father's memory in contrast to his behaviour to her, which she classes as torture. What is more ugly, what she looked like, or her parents' response to her? And, perhaps more significantly, does her father's death release her from the cruel things he said to her? For Disky... Her warring parents' relationship to her was abusive even when it was couched as fun. They joined forces against her in a game they played with her after bath time. Similar to the parental alienation discussed before, the parents manipulate Jenny during this momentary ceasefire. I usually air-dried after a bath. My parents would play a game of he, where he was naked me, twisting out of their reach and running away from one from one whose fingers tickled their way between my legs to my vulva to the other just a few feet away across the room. The game was one of the few occasions when all three of us were together laughing, delighted. No one shouted. There was no crying or slamming the door. No one pulled out the kitchen drawer to find a knife. No one wailing to me about their ruined life, threatening to die. Disky looks back at what happened using a language about her body that is adult, vulva, is not the word of a child. She is running away from each parent, only to be trapped by the other. The child seems to be happy. She is being tickled. There is laughter. Yet also she is aware that for the family to get on, the child herself needs to be played with in this way. 
When they are both elder, older, both daughters move out of their unhappy homes. Kaminsky crumbed to downtown Manhattan and Disky to Doris Lessing's home in London. There they have to deal with their newly widowed mothers after the death of their fathers. Here we will see how both daughters break contact with their mothers to save themselves. Aline Kaminsky Crumb notes her mother's neediness and her own feelings of guilt. In the late 60s, my father died a horrible death and my mother wanted to be my roommate. I'm 38 years old and I'm single for the first time since I was 18 years old. What do you think about sharing an apartment with me? Well, that might be good. Let me think about it. OK. We could rent a beautiful modern apartment on the Upper East Side. Well, actually, I like my neighbourhood, East 3rd Street, between Ave and Ave C, just fine. I feel so guilty rejecting her when she's so alone, but living with her now, when I just got away from her, is my worst nightmare. She's a monster, but now a pathetic monster. We could have a totally different relationship. Like two friends, we could go out together and shop together everything. Her mother seems to have conveniently forgotten her cruelty to her daughter, now that she is alone and needy. Kaminsky Crumb draws herself soft and round, whilst her mum is sharp, almost like she is ready to burst the bubble of Aline's newfound autonomy. This is an example of Kaminsky Crumb's comics when they seem like a hoarder's paradise, crammed full of lines, patterns and objects. Even when this comic has a larger than normal black blank space in the background, the characters' clothes clash, and their hair is a sculpture of obsessive, deeply intense marks. An aesthetic energy of antagonism and angst surrounds the work. Aline sees her mother as a pathetic monster, reminiscent of her father when he was pathetic, when he was contrite. And yet her mother is drawn as if she was still a danger and a threat. Kaminsky Crumb gets herself married to a nice Jewish boy and moves to Arizona to avoid her mother in New York. Autonomous space and distance saves her from that monster. Disky has an equally strained relationship with her parents. Having broken contact with her mother and father, she has no happy resolution with either before their deaths. It was her mother who first dropped her, dropped her off at Doris Lessing's home, and so there is a resonance when years later, Jenny runs out of Lessing's home when her mother responds. Dis returns. Disky's mother re re visited Lessing to tell her daughter her father had died. Disky escapes the conversation and runs out the house. So I wandered down to Camden High Street and took sanctuary in the library. The library had large plate glass windows and my mother, instead of turning left to the nearest tube and bus stop, when she got to the high street, inexplicably turned right and walked right past the library window, not actually past. She was already screaming when she pushed through the doors. I sat in silence while she shrieked and wept, noisily enumerating my faults, not least of which were being just like him, a liar, deceitful, treacherous, heartless, all true actually in this context. It provided some dramatic entertainment for the tramps keeping warm, a couple of genuine students, and the mothers and children choosing their books for the week, to whom she, was, she turned to witness the tragedy of a woman with an unnatural daughter. Jenny took sanctuary in the library, a quasi-religious reference that imbues the surrounding books with a possibility to save and redeem. The sanctuary is where she stays still, and her mother enters and then leaves. It is a sanctuary for her, but not a protected space, because her mother can see and enter, shouting in the silence. Sanctuary suggests that it will be space, a space through which she will be saved from her mother, and sure enough, once her mother leaves the library, she will only reappear in Disky's own books, and never again in real life. Disky survives her mother precisely through the books that surround her, her own forest of books, her own book world. The library is her Arizona, and unlike Aline, she has no guilt. From these places and spaces of pain, Kaminsky, Crum and Disky found a moment when things settled, peace and grace, in autonomy and loving relationships. And this paper ends in a space beyond the pain and distressing experiences of their childhoods into happier moments in adulthood. They both describe these moments as something coming within them, within their own bodies, and a sense of being present in, the, in, the, in their time. There is a separateness from the past and some security in the now. 
Kaminsky Crum explains how a connection to her body and spirituality helped her. Eventually, I became involved in yoga and meditation, and I evolved very much in a different direction. I'm in a very different place than I was when I did much of my comic work. I had cancer last year and almost died. My yoga and meditation really got me through it. I'm healthy now, but I have a very, had a very scary close call with death. Yoga is so humorous, but I really get a lot out of it. I've gotten deeper and deeper into it. And in a comic she drew with her husband, Robert Crumb, she states, and I don't even have anything bad left to say about my mother. There is a beautiful moment in trying to keep still. Described by Disky, after visiting a church, she drives her way back and says, and I noticed I was smiling, a private smile for no one, a smile that blossomed of its own accord deep inside me from my solar plexus and spread beyond my internal boundaries to become the outward physical expression of a contentment that seemed simultaneously to flow down and enclose me like a gossamer call. At peace with the outward world and also having inner peace, the two women have found a place of resolution. The final page of my graphic novel promises acceptance on some level, not a complete resolution. I am moving towards a space similar to that of Kaminsky, Crum and Disky. As I'm finding a world I want, I'm taking care of myself and I'm looking for ways to own my space and my own journey. In the final pages of the book of Sarah, I have the security of therapy, the comfort of the act of walking, and of course, the whole world of drawing. Not perfect, but better. Thank you. Thank you, Ben and David, by the way.